presented by Mahindra World City Jaipur. We have five speakers for you in this session. Hussein Hakani is an author, journalist, academic, and diplomat, in addition to Apologies for that. Prasenjit Basu, I'll read this once again, is a Singapore-based economist and author of Asia Reborn, A Continent Rises. Shiv Shankar Menon is an Indian diplomat who is Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan and Sri Lanka, as well as ambassador to China and Israel. And Suhasini Haider is the diplomatic editor of the Hindu and writes regularly on foreign policy issues. Apologies for those tech issues just now. Please join me in welcoming to the stage for South Asia Walls and Bridges, presented by Mahindra World City Jaipur, Hussein Hakani, Manjushri Tapa, Prasenjit Basu, Shiv Shankar Menon, and Suhasini Haider. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for choosing to uh, come and watch us and listen to us speak about South Asia, speak about um, foreign policy when there's a, uh, there's a panel on cricket, I believe, uh, that's, that's, that's rivaling this one. Um, the fact is that we talk about South Asia quite often. It's uh, probably spoken about more than the term we have this, these days of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but the truth is that the term South Asia hasn't actually been around for more than maybe half a century. Um, and it's had, other, uh, uh, it's had other terms for it, but it essentially means the eight countries that make up the SARC or the South Asian uh, Association for Regional Cooperation. The truth is that SARC as a concept has failed, has actually disappointed even its greatest proponents. But beyond that, if you were to look beyond the, the, the political aspect of, of SARC, and those of you in the audience who may have been privileged enough to visit all or at least a few of, are there any who have visited all the SARC countries? Okay, I do see one or two hands up, three. Um, you're all very privileged. Would, would unmistakably have noticed that there is a common bond. There is no part of South Asia that doesn't share some language, some religion, some culture, some food, uh, some uh, favorite uh, a cartoon character with another part of South Asia. There's, there's a reason why, um, uh, you know, Indian soap operas do so well in Afghanistan or uh, Pakistani serials work in India and we laugh at, at pretty much the same jokes. Um, but the truth is that apart from uh, a lot of the soft power of South Asia, uh, most of its ambitions have not been fulfilled. So what we're going to talk about today is really the concept of walls and bridges. The idea of what actually stopped South Asia from integrating and what perhaps could bring South Asia closer together if that's even something that people uh, would want. Uh, so I do want to go around uh, our panel today uh, and, and ask the basic question, you know, what defines South Asia for you? I, I know Prasenjit 
you've actually tweeted just before this uh, um, uh, session to say that you don't even think it should have been called South Asia, that it should have been called the Indian subcontinent. Tell me more. It always was the Indian subcontinent. Uh, I, I think South Asia is a geographical misnomer. Uh, Southeast Asia, most of Southeast Asia is well south of what we consider South Asia. So the, uh, when Pakistanis and Bangladeshis open restaurants in London, they don't call them South Asian restaurants or even Pakistani or Bangladeshi restaurants. They call them Indian restaurants. So, uh, so really, uh, it's the Indian subcontinent. And it, it, I, I think, first of all, we need to go back a little bit in history because uh, partition is, uh, to my mind, partition was uh, a geopol geopolitical strategy of Britain. They needed it to happen, uh, and it happened as a, as a consequence. Uh, but the other important aspect of what happened with partition is that the violence of partition was concentrated in one province, Punjab. And I think what most of us don't realize is that Punjab was the only province of British India. You're speaking about 1947, 1947. because of there was violence uh, towards the east as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. In 1947, the violence was concentrated in Punjab. Uh, Surawardi you know, had caused violence in, in Bengal a year earlier. But 5,000 people died in the Great Calcutta Killings after Direct Action Day, 16th August 1946. But in 1947, a million, perhaps two million people died in Punjab. And in Punjab, that was the only province in British India that did not have an elected government in 1947. From the 1st of March 1947, there was governor's rule. So the point is that Britain wanted partition, and it wanted to create permanent enmity between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, and so Governor Jenkins, who was, uh, who was uh, running Punjab uh, under governor's rule, essentially allowed it to happen. Even Surawardi in Bengal ensured there was peace. Uh, in Sin, there was very little actual violence. Uh, and of course, in NWFP, in Baluchistan, there was nothing. So the violence was concentrated. Of course, that there's lots of blame to go around. But the ultimate blame, the fact that uh, the, the ultimate success of the British is that we don't blame them today. We blame ourselves. When you have the Partition Museum in Amritsar, nobody has a, a section for Governor Jenkins and the fact that the police and army stood aside and let the violence go on. Right. So, so that, I think, you know, the, the original sin what? really begins there. I, I think and so. if you think about the nature of partition, uh, it was a very narrow thing. For instance, Fazlul Haq. Fazlul Haq was a Bengal leader and he moved, he, he moved the, the Pakistan resolution in 1940. But the interesting thing about him is that in 1938, when Subhash Bose was Congress president, he tried to, he first of all had toppled the governments in Assam and Sindh, replaced them with Congress led coalitions. He proposed the same thing in Bengal a coalition between Congress and Fazlul Haq, and, and that would have a very clear majority. That was shot down by G.D. Birla and Mahatma Gandhi. As a result, Mahatma Gandhi, caused partition to some degree, because he shot this down. Fazlul Haq said, Gandhi is my enemy from this point on. In 1954, when Fazlul Haq became chief minister of East Pakistan, within a month of becoming chief minister of East Pakistan, he came to, Bing to Calcutta and, and gave a speech saying, India is my motherland, and I will spend the rest of my life working to ensure, in 1954, working to ensure Hindustan and Pakistan can be part of India again. He was sacked. As soon as he went back to Dhaka, he was sacked. So, and one other point I'll just quickly no, no, make. No, no, no. Let's, let's wait here because you've put a lot of ideas out there. Yeah. Uh, and the truth is, uh, I would think that the British, if anything, have been a unifying factor for South Asia because we all blame them 70 years later uh, as well. But I do want to talk a little bit about the present and then, of course, we'll come back into India, Pakistan in, in just a bit. Um, Ambassador Menon, you have actually written that you think the South Asian construct is an artificial one. Why do you say that? Well, for a very simple reason. 
we are the only subcontinent in the world. And part of the problem with what he says, if you call it the Indian subcontinent, you immediately put everyone else in that subcontinent off. It's as though you own it, that somehow it's, it it's belongs satellite. to India. Yeah. You might not mean it that way. I mean, we, we, we often tell Nepalese, call it for Indic. instance, Indic. Whatever. <laughs> but, you know, we often tell Nepalese, Aap to bilkul hamare jaise hain. Now, that's the most threatening thing you can say. Because this is a subcontinent uh, that has the same ethnicities across all the borders. These are all brand new states. They might be old nations, but they're brand new states in a Westphalian sense. So, how do you build national identity? If you're a politician in these, one of these new states, and Pakistan maybe is the most extreme example, but it's true of the others as well. You build it against this hyper power who's looming presence in your life, economically, ethnically, religious, all the things that Suhashni says bind us. Also, in a sense, the moment you're trying to build an identity, these things become threats to the identity. So you have a political problem there. But that's not true of anything else when you look at the economies. Look at how well South Asia has been doing for the last two decades. You look at how well Bangladesh has done. I mean, it's remarkable. Pakistan maybe is an outlier, is an exception. But you look at social churn in South Asia in the last 20 years. You look at the affinities across the borders and the way in which several borders are becoming irrelevant. India, Bangladesh, India, Nepal anyway has been irrelevant. India, Bhutan has been. Sri Lanka, ever since we did the free trade agreement in 1997, negotiated in 1997, I think came into force 2000. With each of them, the economies have actually opened up. But, it's, but we must remember that it's a subcontinent. It's linked to the rest of the continent. And geographically, it's only closed in the north with the Himalayas. East and west is where migrations have always happened. And throughout this subcontinent and throughout India, Everybody is a minority, which is why we negotiate everything, we argue about everything, we build coalitions, we fight. But, you know, it's, it's within a family, ultimately. So for me, when you say walls and bridges, the walls are political, but the bridges are everything else. Okay, fair enough. You said South Asia has done so well, yet I'd say South Asia has done so well, but separately. Uh, we're looking at a situation today where... Actually, it's not separate. If the Wait, reason Nepal survived 12 years of a civil war with only one year of negative growth, Sri Lanka, 26 years of civil war with two years of negative growth, was because their economies were open to India and went along with the Indian economy. And that actually pulled along the whole subcontinent. So, that, no, I think so it's hold a, on. No, no, no. Uh, we, uh, uh, there is a reason why we've got the Indians on this side and the South Asians uh, on, on <laughs> the other. Uh, so let's bring them in. Um, Manjushri, uh, of course, we all know you from your, your books ranging back, of course, forget Kathmandu being, uh, uh, you know, so well known over here. Um, you've written a little bit about the influence of India in Nepali politics. Um, but I do want to ask you that question. Essentially, what does constitute South Asia? Is it just India and, uh, and the countries that surround it? Well, I, I mean, I certainly fall on the side of using the term South Asia. I think uh, I agree with Ambassador Menon that uh, an India-centered imagination in India that places itself at the very center and sees everyone else as just the peripheries that it has to deal with is exactly what fuels anti-India sentiment in the neighboring countries. And uh, Nepal is... Um, its nationalism, you know, it has an open border. It's carried along economically by India. It's hugely dependent on India. But almost in denial of these truths, its emotions are extremely touchy about the issue of sovereignty. And so um, I feel like Nepal, certainly when it looks at uh, India, uh, has a very emotional response, whereas India has a more uh, calculated and intellectual response to Nepal and sees where its interest lies. And a lot of times its interest has uh, been with supporting a more conservative political order in Nepal, whether it was 30 years of the monarchy or towards the very end when Nepal wanted to get rid of the monarchy, letting it uh, continue for a few more years or uh, you know, after the UN brokered peace uh, deal, sort of chasing uh, the UN out because the Maoists came into power. 
So I feel like uh, India has a, a more cool and uh, intellectual relationship with Nepal. Nepal's relationship with India is almost entirely emotional and it's very sensitive and it's often dealt with very badly here, I feel. Uh, in terms of the larger South Asia, I think the term South Asia is important. It's part of the Nepali imagination that we're part of something bigger and not just part of an India-Nepal kind of dynamic. Um, and certainly, you know, the borders are so porous between Nepal, Bhutan, Burma, um, you know, East, West, and Nepalese are everywhere. It's a time when Nepalese have been leaving the country in record numbers, and we don't even know how many Nepalese are in India um, or in the rest of the world, actually. So it's, uh, I feel like there's, uh, it's really important to keep in mind the entire uh, relationship between people to people, you know, the soft powers, the arts, the literatures, the imaginative world, the emotional worlds, and also, of course, the state and, and politics. I, I mean, I, I, I would say that there is enough emotion in India as well towards some of its South Asian uh, neighbors, and that brings me to Hussain. Um, uh, Prasenjit has, has written, in fact, that, you know, the idea is a British construct of South Asia and, and really an appeasement to Pakistan which didn't want to be seen as anything but equal in this subcontinent, if you like. How does Pakistan look at its South Asian uh, identity? Because many would say, uh, given the increasing I Islamic tinge to its politics, uh, you know, Pakistan uh, sees much less of its Indic roots and much more of a kind of imagined link to West Asia. Uh, first of all, Suhasni, uh, let me say that I'm someone who repeatedly tells everybody that I'm a Pakistani by citizenship, but I'm an Indian by civilization. And therefore, I don't see these contradictions. I mean, the semantic discussion that uh, we had earlier, should we call it South Asia, should we call it the Indian subcontinent, uh, you know, reminds me of Josh Maliabadi's famous share that alfaz ke sar par nahi ukte mani, alfaz ke sine mein utar kar dekho. So the words are not important. What we are talking about, we all know. I mean, okay, so we understand that because of political emotions in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, even in Bangladesh and Pakistan, a new word or a new term was created, which is South Asia. Fair enough. But if somebody wants to call it Indian subcontinent, I have no problem with it. I mean, I understand those who have a problem with it, but I don't have it. My point is that this is a, a, a geographic area of the world that has had 5,000 years of commonality and only a few decades of partition. It's up to us to define whether those few years of partition will define us or whether the 5,000 years of similarity and commonality and shared history will prevail. Having said that, and I've written a book, by the way, which I, I would uh, like people to pay attention to, it's called Reimagining Pakistan, making the same point that the real issue is how do we reimagine things? Now, for example, Pakistan exists. Should it have existed? Should it not have existed? That's a different argument. But now we have to think about how it can exist in a manner in which it can actually coexist with India without the walls that we have created. Similarly, Bangladesh has emerged after the creation of Pakistan. Nepal also, people would argue, that has a long history of commonality and shared history. But it is a sovereign country, and they respect and want their sovereignty. So how can we actually focus on the commonality rather than trying to constantly dredge up the dissimilarities? And that includes arguments of a semantic kind, which I think is usually the product of a lazy mind. When you're just constantly going about, should we call it this, should we call it that? Let's forget about that. So now let's talk about what exists, what we are talking about. South Asia, Indian subcontinent, slash historic India. This whole region uh, basically was the most connected region uh, in, in 1947. Uh, it had one currency, uh, it had one rail network, it had one communication system, one postal system. Now it's divided into several countries. Um, Europe, on the other hand, uh, which was divided, always has been divided into co several countries, has started coming together. And so they now have one currency which they never had in history. Uh, maybe uh, the Roman Empire, but that also didn't extend to several parts of Europe. So if they can conceptualize coming together, why are we so lacking in imagination that we cannot do it? 
And if we can imagine it, then how will it be done? Well, it will have to be done through several means. One of them is overcoming the current barriers. So, for example, when you ask people, how many people here have been to South Asia, all countries of South Asia, only a few hands went up. Why is that? Because it is impossible to travel from Karachi in Pakistan to Kathmandu without going to Dubai first. There's no direct flights. Uh, similarly, if you are an Indian, the number of Indians who are allowed entry into Pakistan, the number of Indians who get a visa for even Bangladesh is far less than it would be if this was actually one, uh, 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 one whole that saw itself as a whole. Do we have disagreements? Do we have political issues? Let's Absolutely. But then, but then states within the Indian Union have disagreements. So why is it so difficult for us to overcome the lack of imagination of an earlier generation that led them to partition and division? And why can't the new generation actually think up ways of reimagining this whole region and coming up with ideas whereby the walls fall and we actually can travel to each other, understand each other, and interact with each other, just as the restaurants that were mentioned. It's very funny, by the way. If the Bangladeshi is the owner, the restaurant sometimes says Bangladeshi slash Indian restaurant. If the Pakistani is the owner, it says Pakistani slash Indian restaurant. If a Nepalese is the owner, it says Nepali slash Indian restaurant. And yet, none of them are willing to call it just Indian restaurants, which you and I probably wouldn't have a problem with calling them. All right. Um, Prasenjit, Hussein brings up this point. Hussein brings up this point that eventually the sword for South Asia, the South Asian identity is there just below, just waiting to be unleashed, if you like. Um, if I've read Asian powers correctly, um, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're um, much more uh, focused on India's place in Asia, on the big table, if you like, and its civilizational roots with so many countries in Southeast Asia and, uh, and others. Um, why is it that India's South Asian identity is not enough? Well, actually, first of all, you know, your, your point at the beginning, you, you basically assume that SARC has failed and that South Asia as a concept has failed. I strongly disagree with that. Uh, if you look at the relationship between India and Bangladesh, the economic relationship is very deep and it's been particularly deep over the last 10 years. It's been relatively deep since 1981, since Irshad uh, became president. And Bangladesh, as a consequence, is one of the most successful countries in the world, economically. Uh, it is the fastest growing economy other than India in the, in the world among large economies with populations of more than 100 million people um, over the last 10 years. So, uh, and, and remittances from Bangladesh to India are the third highest of any country. Uh, and, and remittances the other way are also very high. So it, it is a deep relationship. There's, there are very few trade barriers between India and Bangladesh. India and Nepal have, um, have is essentially an economic union. Just like the European Union, there's absolutely no barriers to trade in goods and services. Uh, people can move across borders without hindrance between India and Nepal. Uh, and, and the relationship with, with Sri Lanka is getting deeper. Uh, there was, of course, an attempt to prize Sri Lanka away uh, from the Indian embrace into a Chinese embrace, which has failed quite dramatically over the last four years, and really? especially over the last two months. And similarly, with, with the to Maldives. The China factor. And so, so the Maldives as well. So, so in effect, what we have is the only relationship that is dysfunctional in South Asia, as you put it, South Asia, is the India-Pakistan one. And the India-Pakistan one actually goes back a little bit more in history. In 1959, Pakistan was to hold its first election. It became a republic in 1956, and the first election was supposed to be in 1959. It became clear by late 1957, early 1958, that the election in Pakistan, which included East Pakistan then, would be won in every state by pro-India or left-wing parties. Most likely in Punjab, it would be won by the communists, who were led by Raj Babbar's father-in-law, uh, and in the rest by pro-India parties. So that election never happened. And the reason, I, the reason I bring this up is because the Americans allowed Ayub Khan to take over Pakistan and 
Okay, the problem with all over the, place the India Pakistan here. relationship is the Pakistan army. There's nothing else to it. Okay. Uh, we no. get your point. And in fact, I think the point you're making is essentially that South Asia is held back by the India Pakistan problem. And the no, amount of the effort rest, that is spent. The rest spent is on fine. The rest. the rest is fine. But it certainly doesn't get as much space uh, in, in a lot of what you're saying. Ambassador Menon, why don't you, um, uh, you know, answer this debate? Uh, is Sark dead? No. Not at all. In fact, for me, the reality of South Asia, whatever you want to call it. Not South Asia, but the South Asian Association. No. We haven't met since 2014. So what? It doesn't look like we will meet so in what? the So what? All future. the working parts of SARC, whether it's SAFTA, whether it's on the trade side, whether it's on, on the other things, between everybody except India and Pakistan is working. And it goes on working. And, you know, we keep saying, oh, this region is not integrated. I think the World Bank uses a figure of only 6% of its trade is with each other within yes. South Asia. But that ignores the fact that we smuggle much more than we trade officially because nobody in South Asia pays taxes. You know, I mean, actual trade with Pakistan is probably three times the official figure, somewhere in the region of $3 billion, I think, 2.8 or something is the official. But everything goes through Dubai, through Colombo, through Singapore. You know, I think it's time we looked at reality. And we dealt with it. And the fact is that South Asia is integrated in a whole set of ways that we underestimate. And we should just accept that and work with it. I think India-Pakistan relations, the moment you bring that in, yes, it colors your whole view. But I think they're a unique case. I mean, the kind of ethnic cleansing that happened in the Punjab in one fell swoop never happened anywhere else. With Bangladesh, you had repeated crises, 50, 51, 55, 44, when you had Liak of 71, of course, was the ultimate one. But that was a whole different set of issues, which, frankly, today are behind us. But if you look at the numbers of, of Indians, of Bangladeshis, of Nepalese, of Sri Lankans living, working, remitting money, and so on, it's really quite amazing how integrated we are. All so right. let's not you know, keep saying, oh, we're a terrible people, we're not integrated, we don't work with each other. It's not true. All right. That's certainly a hopeful way of looking at it. Manjushri, you're the only non-Indian, non-Pakistani on, uh, uh, on this panel. So let me ask you, what is your view of how India-Pakistan ties impact South Asia? Oh, you know, I feel like one of the problems that Nepal has, certainly with uh, having relationships with the other countries, is that India is the most important relationship for it. Um, and of course, when dealing with India, Nepal never knows who it's dealing with, whether it's dealing with you know, the border. I mean, Bihar has just uh, banned alcohol, so now there's a huge industry around new hotels and alcohol sort of uh, industries in, uh, across the border in Nepal, whether we're dealing with you know, mafia smuggling rings uh, officially, whether we're dealing with South Bloc, whether we're dealing with one official in South Bloc, a diplomat, a politician, are we dealing with Hindutva, are we dealing, you know, it's, it's very confusing and very complex as a relationship. And the confusion really is, as Ambassador Menon said again, around the modern state. Civilizationally, we obviously are very, very linked. Um, so the modern states, Nepal has never really had a chance uh, to go through what perhaps India did in the Nehruvian socialist years, which is to really find its democratic soul uh, as a functioning democracy, and is really just trying to go through that right now. Uh, which is so, you know, it's, it's not on the same, you know, Bangladesh went through it at a different period, Sri Lanka has been through it at a different period, Bhutan has its own relationship, Maldives is, is, is <laughs> struggling. Um, so I feel like for Nepal to make common cause with all of these countries is very, very challenging. It really is primarily India that it's looking at. Pakistan, I think, has been a very difficult, um, I mean, again, civilizationally very connected, but in terms of you know, the struggles that Pakistan is going through, I think Nepal is really looking for help becoming a liberal democracy without a strong army, without a, a sort of, uh, and, and it's trying to become secular. It's trying to become a federalized state it's trying to have proportional representation, become more inclusive. So all of these are models that it gets from India, primarily. And that's, the, that's what Nepal is looking at. So the other countries, it's more, again, it's emotional, but it's not so as dealing, pragmatic. Because I, I know that you contribute to the Himal magazine, which is actually the only South Asian magazine uh, at, at present. And the way Himal pre presents the map 
of South Asia is upside down. Um, and they do that with the reason of saying, look at it from our point of view. Don't always see it from the Indian point of view. And what we are seeing is all of South Asia below the Himalayan um, uh, arms, uh, if you like. Um, Hussein, you've, you've uh, dealt with this relationship, not just in the India-Pakistan context, but as ambassador uh, to the US. Do you think, in a sense, South Asia comes more sharply into focus uh, as an identity when you're outside of this region. Because inside this region, we have more trouble seeing ourselves as one unit. But you know, anyone who's been to the United Nations or anywhere else can tell you <clears throat> that you walk into a room full of you know, 200 nationalities and the South Asians will find one corner and be, be chatting in it. Do you think actually the problem is that we don't get this overview perception? Well, I think we have a lot of difficulty in distinguishing between civilization and state or between identity, uh, political identity, and national identity, and cultural identity. I think we have much more overlap in cultural identity than we have in political identity right now. And then, uh, because of the way politics has been in the subcontinent, I think one of the things that uh, we discovered under the British, since we are all uh, agreed upon sort of blaming the British as much as we can, it's, it's one of the best things that unites us. Uh, uh, I think that uh, one of the things they did was they created the whole political map in which people play to uh, communalism and, uh, and narrower identities, going back all the way to the separate electorates. So because of that, those identities play out domestically, but when we are freed from the region and we are abroad, well, we, we realize that when people used to, you know, you remember the time in Britain that people, racist white people used to attack brown people, they called it packy bashing. They didn't make a distinction between who was from Bangladesh, who was from Pakistan, and who was from India, and who was from Nepal. For them, all were packies because that's the pejorative they had invented for the brown man from, from South Asia. So I think that that is something that is a product of the circumstances. But what I am trying to talk about, and I haven't seen my co-panelists come towards that yet and haven't seen you drive them towards that, is what can be done sure. to overcome the distinctions that have been created by politics, including the India-Pakistan divide, which is a very constructed divide rather than a natural divide. If, after all, if I, born in Pakistan, of parents who immigrated from India during the partition, if I can have the views that I have, and I know that a lot of young Pakistanis have those views, and, and I'm not young, I'm older. And a lot uh, of Indians, and a lot of And a lot uh, of Indians South have Asians, that. Actually. So whenever I meet people, I mean, I find that a lot more uh, uh, Indians and Pakistanis want to overcome the political divide. Why is it that we are not able to do it? I think we need a more substantive discussion on that and a more substantive discussion on external factors like the American military assistance, et cetera, and how that sustained that division, and how we can let the common culture override the separation of politics. And lastly, can we reconcile to the reality that there can be multiple Rajyas or multiple countries and yet be one people and, and, and have that common thread? All right. Um, I do want to come to all the points that Hussein has wanted me to raise, but I do want to ask you, Prasenjit, about the point you made on China earlier. Uh, you said, you know, China has failed to snatch Sri Lanka away. The truth is very different. If you look in South Asia, Pakistan is dealing with CPEC um, and this massive 50 plus billion dollar investment. Uh, Sri Lanka, no matter what you say, continues to take not only Chinese uh, infrastructure, but Chinese aid. Uh, the Maldives is going to struggle with that question. Bangladesh is running an entire railway system um, from uh, China. They're certainly all part of the Belt and Road. Nepal might see a train line come in from Tibet. Uh, Nepal has already got access to dry docks um, or dry ports, as they're called, in China. Um, the distance. The, the question, the question, is, the, and, and the the question is, the distances are being spanned in a progressive manner. Um, and many, many countries in the SARC have in the past spoken about China. So do you see China becoming a South Asian country at one point? Far from it. Uh, first of all, I think the problem with the, the so-called Belt and Road Initiative that, that China is propagating 
uh, is the fact that it is uh, an extremely ambitious plan that can only work if China has perpetual current account surpluses that will enable China to export capital to all its satellites like Pakistan and, uh, and Sri Lanka. And the sad reality is that 2018 uh, is the last year that China will have a current account surplus. Uh, in fact, in the first half of last year, there was a current account deficit. For the full year, there's likely to be just a small surplus. And that surplus is over. So if China itself doesn't have a current account surplus, it is not possible for China to keep funding the rest of the world uh, through this big initiative called Belt and Road. Now, if you look at it from the perspective of Pakistan, look at Pakistan's current situation. It has foreign reserves of about $8 billion. That's not even enough to meet about a month and a half's import cover. Uh, and if you look at its debt to China, it is about, it, it is about double the size of its foreign reserves. So it now needs an IMF program, but the IMF is not willing to lend to Pakistan until the issue of the Chinese debt is sorted out. And the same applies to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has an IMF program, uh, and it too has this enormous debt to China. So from the sustainability standpoint, China has tied itself in knots with its, uh, its so-called satellites, Hi, and there is no way that this sort of relationship can be sustained over okay. any sort of longer period. And so Africa has already said to China that, you know, we better, you, we need to back, you need to back off. Uh, and it's, it'll be a matter of time before Pakistan comes to the same conclusion. Imran Khan, over the course of the next six months, will probably come around to a similar conclusion. And in, uh, you know, uh, yeah, Raja I Paksa in Sri Lanka wanted to be a Chinese satellite. If he succeeded with his constitutional coup, the IMF would have not lent any money to Sri Lanka, and that would have been the end of the All dream right. of you, you, Sri Lanka. You put Nikita our Africa. minds at rest on this issue for the moment. Uh, until China brings out another loan to another South Asian country. But I do want to spend the next, we have about 10 minutes before I come to the audience for questions, um, to talk about uh, what Hussein had actually mentioned. What are the ways that we can cross these boundaries that we have built uh, for ourselves? Last year, I met a Bangladeshi entrepreneur. She basically had a small business that had become much bigger, uh, which essentially just uh, ran fat labs in Bangladesh. What did those path labs do? They prepped patients who were coming to India for surgeries and gave those test results to the hospitals in India so that those patients didn't have to spend an extra week or 10 days in India doing tests over here. There are other projects on um, uh, climate change. There are other projects on working on agriculture. You know, India and Pakistan actually do a lot of cooperation when it comes to studies on agriculture, just not in, in the frameworks that uh, that we are all aware of. There's, um, you know, flood patterns and, and maritime, uh, uh, you know, um, mapping that is done between the countries over here. Um, and my final point is really looking at the next generation. Uh, because last year, in fact, one of the colleges just outside Delhi set up a program where they decided to teach a common history between India and Pakistan, something I think only the Germans and the French really attempted after the World War. Uh, and the idea was that one Lahore University and this Delhi University uh, would bring its students together over Skype in order to discuss a common history, a common idea of history. So there are those ideas out there. I want to go around this very, very expert panel to get a sense of whether there are new bridges that can be built given technology given the new geopolitics, uh, and given the new generation? Well, I think there's three things that I would say. One is, we should stop being frightened, saying, oh, the Chinese are coming, the Americans are coming, you know. You can't look at South Asia as an exclusive space, as an Indian. Uh, and even Belt and Road, ultimately, you know, if you owe the bank enough money, you own the bank. So you, you don't need to... I mean, I don't think we should be panicking about this. Oh, look, the Chinese are lending money to people who can't pay it back. That's a Chinese problem. It's, it's not the debtor's problem. But we need to look at it as how do we actually connect South Asia with the rest of the world because that's where we are, will be together. And many of the economic things we do, which it shouldn't be just what we do between us. It's what we should do with Southeast Asia, what we need to do with Central Asia, 
with China as well. There are things that, and frankly, that railroad, for instance, if we built a railroad too, it actually works for both sides, even though the economics of it are going to be very iffy because it'll be very expensive. That's one. I think you need to change the mindset here about this exclusive closed space and anybody coming in as a threat and other people are all the cause of our trouble. No longer. Secondly, look at the hard issues, security. I don't think any South Asian states except India and Pakistan have a security dilemma. None of us really believe the other one's going to swallow us. I mean, that's not what any of you us said. The debate over the no. NRC and Bangladesh no, wait, and India has been I'm asked coming strong. to that. That's a separate problem. The, because ultimately, I don't see why you cannot talk about collective security in the region together. It's a logical thing to do. And it might even reassure Pakistan to a certain extent. Could. I don't think Pakistani politics or the internal structure of Pakistan will allow it, but it's a possibility in any case. But the third problem is you have transborder ethnicities and the reason why our citizenship bill is an issue, for instance, is precisely this, that there are no real borders in South Asia. There are no natural boundaries in this, whether ethnically, religiously, linguistically, and so on. And so you need to therefore make those artificial borders, these are all man-made constructs, make them irrelevant rather than trying to build these little walls by a citizenship law and then saying only Hindus or only this or only that. The more walls you build, the less chance you have of success. And I think those are the three things that I would, they're all hard things. But sure. it's worth going at these. Certainly, and the ridiculousness of the border, I think, has come into focus in the last few months uh, over the Kartarpur corridor, where you have this uh, unnatural border just put right there, whereas the, uh, the, birth uh, the, the final resting place of Guru Nanak is just four kilometers uh, across the boundary. Um, Hussein, do you think that there are others? You certainly mentioned the idea of visas and allowing people to travel between the countries. What else? Well, I have been arguing about uh, more travel as a way of knowing each other. One of the things that often surprises me each time I come to India is how few Indians actually know much about Pakistan. They don't. And Pakistanis know very little about India. Uh, now, the other countries do, but there also there's often not enough information. I think that Ambassador Menon's three points are very important. Uh, but also at the same time, I think it's about time we change the discourse of South Asia. Instead of the discourse of South Asia only being negative, negative in terms of, oh God, dunya kharab ho gai, zindagi kharab ho gai, rona, dhona, because this is what happened, which we are entitled to do, but that should have been done 70 years ago. And now 70 years later, I think we need to go overcome that and say, okay, how are we plotting the future? Second, we have to identify we have, have to identify the constituencies for peace and for, uh, for, uh, for uh, bridge building and wall diminishing across the region. So we have to be understanding of the, say for example, the Nepalese and their concerns about sovereignty. Uh, we have to be understanding of those in Bangladesh who have But don't let that be the focus. I think one of the things that is happening is that with uh, these evening TV circuses that we call television news shows, the day-to-day -day is becoming more important and no one actually talks the big picture. And the big picture is, do I want my children to grow up with the same kind of anger and hatred that was attempted to be cultivated in my generation by my government? And I overcame it. But I don't want them to have to make the struggle to overcome it they should be able to see the neighbor as the neighbor, not as the enemy. I'm coming to you in just a sec, but I want to give Manjushri uh, the last word. Any ideas about building the bridges and bringing down the walls? I'm, uh, I'm a great believer in soft power. I feel like that's the only kind of power that's really worked to build bridges and to connect people. Um, you know, so Nepal obviously has an open border. The biggest language there is Nepali. Second biggest language is Bhojpuri. Then it's Maithili. And these are cross-border languages. There are three million Nepali speakers in India. Some of the best Nepali literature in the Nepali language is coming out of Darjeeling or out of the Northeast. So, you know, these are all, I think, the arts, literature, um, organizations that can uh, communicate with each other, people-to-people -people organizations. I think all of that is really ultimately what's going to work. 
Um, it's a little emotional again. I'm, I'm a Nepali, so I get to be emotional about this. But I also feel like the, it's, there's a special burden on India to, 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 to use soft power towards the right end, which is to support secularism, to support federalism, to support decentralization of power, to support the empowerment of women, to support inclusion, and all of these aspirations that I think are certainly uh, what Nepal is uh, struggling with right now and, and is trying to figure out. Um, I feel like there's a special burden on India to do that because um, it's, you know, Nepal looks for, so Nepal looks at the, the Nepal army at times, looks at the Pakistan army as a model and wonders if it should go that way rather than the, as the Indian army as a, taking that as a model. So I feel like there is a real responsibility for India as the most stable democracy in this er in South Asia to really take, take use soft power towards that end. Sure, certainly, and it, it's an important point you, uh, you make that India has the largest responsibility. I think uh, Kishore Mahbubani, when speaking about the ASEAN miracle, said that essentially if it hadn't been for Indonesia taking a back uh, seat and allowing the other countries of ASEAN uh, to take the forward movement, uh, perhaps the ASEAN miracle would not have happened. Can I see with a show of hands how many people, oh my God, want to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just. Yeah. My name is Anurag. Since uh, it's not been mentioned today, can you please kindly shed light on how can culture be the uh, bridge to overcome walls of separation? All right. Uh, let's take a few more questions if possible. Why don't you go back? Sure. Uh, good evening, uh, Ambedja Hakani. My question to you is that all the prime ministers in Pakistan, we all know that either they are a product of establishment like Mohammad Khan Junejo or Nawaz Sharif, or they try to cultivate basic min minimum working relationship with the establishment like Benzir, late Benzir Bhutto did in her time. But the result is always a failure. Beyond a point, it doesn't survive and they are shown the door. So my question to you is that current prime minister, we all know is a product of establishment, the deep state, Mr. Imran Khan. Do you think his fate will be any different? Will he survive his term or the Rahul, uh, Rahul Pindi cops will show him the door? All right, a specific question. I want to take some from the back, please, because they've been waiting patiently. Could you please, yeah, go take the mic to some of the people at the back? Uh, sir, basically, I've always been saying that... Just speak right into the mic. Okay. Possible. Right, can you hear me? Uh, what I've always been saying is that Europe, India already is what Europe is trying to become. And as Ambassador Hakani said, uh, if Europe can do it, why can't we? Well, uh, there are lots of uh, similarities between India, Pakistan, and the neighbors and the European countries. But there is one bugbear which is not there in Europe and is there in the subcontinent. And that is religion. And unfortunately, the rabid elements in religions are what is keeping us apart. So Ambassador Hakani, how do you propose that is sorted out? That's, that's a fair question. I, I want to come to the lady in this. Yeah. Right there, in the last but one line. Right here. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, Just hold you. on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, please go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Uh, hi. So, uh, Safta has uh, very primarily focused on trade of goods and services. But all the countries in SAC are labor intensive countries. Our biggest import is labor. So, shouldn't uh, SAC have, in Safta specifically, work together to improve our, the quality of our labor? And shouldn't it be more free-flowing within the country to improve the relations? All right. I I'm glad you even Hello. raised SAFTA. And there's one lady in the front. I here. have the mic oh, here. Sorry, go sorry. ahead. Uh, so yeah, my question is more particular about the peace talk with Taliban. Why don't you just stand up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the peace talk with Taliban has been the hot topic not in Afghanistan, uh, across sure. South Asia and the world. I wanted to ask Am Ambassador Manon and um, Ambassador Haqqani what South Asia could, what role could they play to bring Taliban to the peace, and particularly a country that has sponsored and considered to be the founding father of Taliban, Pakistan, of course, what role they can play in India as a friend country? What South Asia can play or what India can play? 
South Asia, India, and particularly founding father of Taliban, Pakistan. Perfect. Um, and one more, if everyone remembers that. Go ahead. Yeah. मैं अकानी साहब से पूछना चाह रहा हूँ कि बांग्लादेश ऑलरेडी आजाद हो चुका है हाफ ऑफ पाकिस्तान और सिंध बलूचिस्तान और एनडब्ल्यूएफपी में भी अब आजादी के नारे लगने लग गए हैं तो ऐसे में आप पाकिस्तान का फ्यूचर क्या देखते हैं और दूसरा छोटा सा एक लाइन का कि आप अपना पाकिस्तान जाने का क्या प्रोग्राम रखते हैं Okay, Hussain, you've got a bulk of the first question, so I'm going to let you take them. One about Pakistan's future, your future, and Imran Khan's future. Three oh questions. God. Okay. Uh, before that, why don't I answer the question that was not about anybody's future, but about how can, you know, how can culture be the basis? And I think basically if you em emphasize the similarity and, and commonality of the culture, then you actually diminish the dissimilarity of the politics. That's, that's the... That's what the, at least that's what I meant when I talked about emphasizing that. I'm sure others can talk about more. Imran Khan's future, very frankly, uh, I do not see it as very different uh, from that of other Pakistani political leaders. Uh, he is a creature of the military, uh, and if he confronts the military, uh, which I don't think he will, uh, because uh, he has taken, he has been in politics 30 years, and he, uh, it took him 30 years to become prime minister. I don't think he wants to give that up too quickly. Um, and so I don't think he will confront, but if he does, then there will be the same confrontation. Question is, has Pakistan changed sufficiently that he will be able to do it more successfully? After all, Mr. Nawaz Sharif still has more support, even though he was the Punjabi leader who confronted the military. So maybe Imran Khan can have support for confronting the military, but I don't see him moving in that direction right now. As far as the future of Pakistan is concerned, I deliberately talk about the future of South Asia because the region as a whole has a much better future together. Uh, and I would hope that the Pakistan that I advocate as a reimagined Pakistan in which the Sindhis, the Baloch, the Pashtun, uh, the Punjabis, the Saraikis, uh, the Urdu-speaking community of Pakistan and the people of Gilgit and Baltistan all have rights according to a very uh, uh, autonomous, autonomy-granting federal uh, state, then I think Pakistan can succeed. Uh, as far as the question of uh, uh, the, the people of Baluchistan and Sindh uh, finding the kind of success that the people of Bangladesh did, that was a particular circumstance. I don't think those circumstances exist now. But the people of Balochistan and Sindh do deserve the support, and the people of Pakhtunkhwa do deserve the support of all democratic forces from around the world for their democratic rights. As right. far as my own future is concerned, I am too small a man that I should actually spend any time discussing my future. I think that my real role is to say things that most Pakistanis have become afraid of saying. Well, we certainly hope, uh, we're certainly grateful that you come here in any case, um, President Chief, do you want to take the SAFTA question and the idea of the South Asian labor union in a sense, because it's not just pertinent to within South Asia or, or uh, as competition, but in West Asia, if South Asian communities actually work closer together, maybe our labor could get a better deal. Maybe labor standards, wages would not be about competing with each other. Well, I think that's a very interesting idea, partly because, of course, uh, China is running into a labor shortage and, and so uh, labor intensive manufacturing is looking for new homes and uh, initially the new home for labor intensive manufacturing has been Vietnam and Bangladesh. One of uh, our SARC countries is a significant beneficiary. Uh, India clearly needs labor market reforms and the labor market reforms have never generated enough political consensus internally. Uh, but perhaps the South Asian stimulus can play a part in, uh, in bringing about rational change in labor market policies and, and labor laws uh, to enable this entire region to really uh, fulfill its destiny. Because if you look at any countries that have ever industrialized in history, every single country has started with textiles, garments, shoes, toys, and processed food. Uh, the only country that thinks it can industrialize without doing that is India. Uh, and India, in every generation, has a new generation of economists arguing 
that, now we have the third industrial revolution. We are benefiting from that. We have the fourth one. Forget about the first and second. Uh, and as a result, we haven't really created the millions of jobs that uh, would enable a transformative change uh, in the economy to occur. And uh, if South Asia is the excuse to bring about that change, uh, more power to that idea. Very, very well put. Ambassador Menon, you want to take the Taliban question? Also a huge debate in India today about whether India should, like everyone else, be talking to the Taliban. Well, about the Taliban in Afghanistan's politics, that's something that the Afghans have to sort out for themselves. It's not for Pakistan or India to tell Afghans, this is how you will constitute your government or this is what you will do. From our point of view as India, I think we should do whatever we can to encourage that the Taliban become mainstreamed, that they give up their more extreme ideas, that they stop treating women the day, way they do, and that certainly they be disarmed before they become part of any authority in Afghanistan. But how it's done, which happens first, how they share power, whether it's provincial and so on, that's not for us to say. And I think we should be very clear on what our role is in that. About talking to the Taliban, talking to anyone, you know, uh, it's the job of intelligence agencies to stay close to everybody and talk to everybody, but they will never tell you when they do. So some questions are best not asked, I think. All right. And certainly, uh, I India has a role in keeping connected to Afghanistan as a part of South Asia, um, because the fear otherwise is that Afghanistan becomes a part of Central Asia over if there. If I might just note there, one little there, idea here. I have here. a problem there. You know, Indians tend to exaggerate this threat from Afghanistan as an extreme. I've never known of an Afghan terrorist in India. Have you? In the last 40 years? And it's the only terrorism out of Afghanistan was when Lashkar and so on were moved out of Pakistan by the ISI into Afghanistan, into training camps in Khost and other places because of the heat they felt when they were in Pakistan. But this is actually Pakistani terrorism, and let's not make any mistake about that. No, and also, I think the other uh, uh, idea, if you're thinking about it, if, you, if this is an ideas forum, uh, there are more Pakhtuns in Pakhtunkhwa than there are in Afghanistan. So uh, the Duran line, uh, abolishing the Duran line may be uh, an idea whose time will eventually come uh, to enable uh, a different solution to, to occur uh, and of course, that was part of what uh, the Frontier Gandhi was advocating for a, right, for a long time. From walls well. and bridges, we're now getting into uh, borders as well. Manjushri, uh, the question on religion and the fact that religion is so important to all South Asians, but different religions are, can we overcome those? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question because uh, Nepal is very much uh, having the same debate that I think India is over secularism. Uh, the constitution that was passed in 2015 has defined it as a secular nation, which allows for the practice of Buddhism, which is a big religion in Nepal, uh, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, all of the other religions, including Bon and small animist religions, um, all of this. So it's t it clearly civilizationally, it's a very important thing. It's a very religious area. Um, but I think the state has come around to wanting a secular structure and tolerance for all. And so, again, once again, for Nepal, it's very confusing when India, which has been its uh, model for how to become a democratic, federalized, secular nation, uh, suddenly, you know, starts uh, saffronizing and uh, supports the majority religion over other religions or starts to have emotions towards okay. that. Yeah, this majoritarian impulse, I think, is very confusing for Nepal. Now, interestingly, in Nepal, uh, because India sort of mishandled the constitution drafting process, there's a very strong anti-India sentiment in Nepal right now, uh, which is resisting the saffronization, the pressure to saffronize in Nepal and to bring back the monarchy or to bring back a Hindu state. So, uh, I interestingly, again, this very deeply emotional and touchy relationship between India and Nepal sometimes has supported a more progressive impulse in Nepal. So in this case, it's been sort of helpful for this anti-India feeling because 
people uh, you know, link it very strongly with the Indian state right now, saffronization with the Indian state and want so to So hyper-nationalism in one South Asian state actually triggers more in another. Uh, so, Hany, uh, so ask me two quick points. Uh, the gentleman who asked the question about religion gave the reference of Europe. And he, we should not forget that Europe had its religious wars for 500 years ago. And so it, maybe perhaps we should look at the other side of the equation that we might have those sentiments now but we can overcome them with a more secular ideal. And the gentleman who asked me the question about uh, the future of Pakistan, let me say the future of Pakistan will be brighter when Pakistanis start thinking of Hafiz Saeed as the traitor and of me as the patriot. Certainly, and, and since uh, the gentleman here asked about culture, I'll very quickly tell a story that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that I uh, saw with my own eyes in Uzbekistan a few months ago where um, there was someone from the Dili Gharana going to uh, perform. But before him, there was a kawal from Pakistan. And he finished his, uh, uh, you know, singing. And in fact, he had the audience on its feet. Uh, he was getting the Uzbekis to actually repeat a lot of the lines from the kawali. And it was all from the Dili Gharana itself, but he was Pakistani. And when he finished, uh, you know, people were on their feet cheering and then shouting, we love India. Uh, to which he smiled very sweetly and said, well, I love India too, but I'm Pakistani. So he said maybe he loved Pakistan a little more. Um, but it just didn't matter in that one place uh, out there in Uzbekistan that people were from different countries of South Asia. I think that is perhaps the, 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 the real wall and the real bridge uh, between us all. But ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. I'll hand over to you. A big thank you to Hussein Hakani, Manjushri Tapa,